I'm not sure whose bright idea it was to continue to let them grow even as they had their root balls literally centimeters from the house's foundation. How do you replace the single thing that your entire house is sitting on? Oh, this siding. <laughs> Not to mention the spray foam. Let's not even talk about the spray foam. That is, in my opinion, one of the biggest swindles of the modern home improvement arena. And yes, that is the hill I will be dying on. Hello friends, and welcome back to another episode here in my Victorian duplex in Nova Scotia. If you're new here, I'm Shannon Makes, peeling wallpaper preservationist by day, circus artist by night. And I bought this cheap old house sight unseen last summer. And the last few videos on the channel, I've taken you with us in our first few days here at the house as we tried to make some headway on cleaning it out and making it somewhat more livable. It's been a grand adventure so far, so if you haven't seen those, I highly recommend watching them and getting caught up. But today we're taking a short pause in the breakneck pace with which we've been checking things off the list because I've realized there's a part of the puzzle that I've been withholding. Completely unintentionally, I promise, but as I was releasing these videos, I was filled with this nagging feeling that there was something I was missing. That there was something I was just neglecting to communicate properly about the situation, and it's taken me almost a month, but now I've realized it. I was so busy focusing on the good, on the parts of my house that I fell in love with and what made me buy it, that I forgot to walk you through all the things that are wrong with it. Like, I didn't make it clear to the extent to which this house is kind of on the verge of collapsing. Now, if you're all caught up, you already know that there's no working plumbing and that the basement is flooded, but buckle up because that's barely even scratching the surface. So, I thought it would be a good idea if we can use this week to sort of get on the same page so y'all can realize the full scope of the work we have ahead of us, because trust me, it goes way further than just replumbing the house. And then next week, we'll jump back into the more traditional vlog style renovations. So let's go. Now, these aren't gonna be in order of priority or how bad each thing is and how fast we're going to tackle them. Instead, they're gonna be more in order of cause and effect. Although honestly, the sort of overarching cause of most of these problems is water, but you'll see there is kind of a logical order to all of these problems. So I thought, let's go through them all first and then talk about how we're gonna tackle them. And a good place to start is gonna be the back of our house. Now, I know you haven't seen very much of the exterior of the house. You're gonna get some glances now and also in upcoming episodes, I promise. But the main and first source of all the water that is trashing our house is the absolutely giant hill that we're sitting at the bottom of. So let's go outside really quick and take a look and I'll explain a bit further. Okay. So here's the state of our backyard right now as it stands. It is kind of a mess, but that's not really what we're concerned about right now. I kind of want to show you the hill, the hill that is causing all the problems. And I'm looking at it on camera and it really doesn't look like that much of a hill. But if we stop and take a look at our neighbor's house up there, so this is their ground level. Then it drops down about four feet or so to the street level. And there's another roughly four feet drop to the high section of our yard. And then there's about six or seven feet drop down to the low section of our yard. So why is this a problem? Who cares if our house sits at the bottom of a hill? Well, I do for one, because whenever it rains or when the snow melts, all of that water comes rushing down the hill and into our house, specifically our basement. And that has led to a lot of problems. Some of them are probably quite obvious and evident and some we'll get into shortly. There are a few different ways to deal with this, but they all pretty much fall under the category of proper grading. Grading just being a fancy way of saying moving the earth so the water runs away from your house. Because in a perfect world, the earth would sort of slope away from our house in all directions so that when it rains or when the snow melts, that water is gonna want to run away from our foundation. This being a video, however, about all the things that are wrong with our house, you've probably already guessed that this is not the case. And indeed, the grading around the back half of our house specifically is just funneling all of the water 
off of that hill directly towards the back of our house. It's like our house is just opening up its arms to the hill and saying, give me all your water. But no, no, we don't want all of your water. Take it back. <laughs> we'll come back to this in a minute, but first let's move on to problem number two. Number two is the gutters, or rather the lack thereof, because this is a massive house with an enormous footprint and all of the water from the roof tends to funnel into four different places and none of them have gutters. Now, Phil and I went and had a little jaunt back in time using the Google Maps archives, and it turns out there haven't been gutters in here for over a decade. So that's at least 10 years of water in one of the wettest provinces in the country, all being channeled into a few very specific locations at the base of our house. Normally, the gutters would take that water and shuttle it away from our house, but no, straight at the foot of our foundation, which leads us to problem number three, the foundation, which in its defense is surprisingly stable in the majority of places. However, there are four places where it's struggling with life. And can you guess where those four places are? If you've guessed that it's the four corners where the roof dumps all its water at the base of our house due to its lack of gutters, you'd be correct. That's exactly where we're having problems. And it's worse in the back of the house than in the front because the hillside is exaggerating the effect and just shoveling that much more water into the already weak foundation. So we're seeing varying degrees of issues with the foundation from a little bit of sagging, shifting and or bulging to it just outright collapsing in one little section. Now, we did know about this. The inspection report did state that there were some sections of the foundation that were showing signs of movement or displacement, but the problem was that the worst part was not really accessible to our home inspector. So the extent of the damage was not fully known until we arrived and could really start poking around for ourselves. And this might be a good time to touch on the house inspection process because there will inevitably be a small handful of keyboard warriors who, let's be honest, have probably already added their two cents down in the comment section, criticizing me for being naive or unprepared or maybe not getting a house inspection. And there's probably already at least one of you that's saying that I should sue my house inspector for not doing his job. You're probably American. We don't really do that here. But also for the record, yes, we did have a house inspection. Yes, it was very thorough, but also house inspections by law are limited. They're not allowed to cause damage to the property during the inspection. They can't uh, inspect areas of the house that are hidden or obscured. They can't, you know, pull up carpeting or move furniture to get a better look at something. And if you remember the house tour, there was a lot of furniture. There was just a lot of stuff in here that was very much in the way of a house inspection. So our report was very lengthy and very detailed. It was several pages long with a lot of photos. He went to all four floors. He used a drone to inspect the roof. Like he did a very good job, but you know, there was just stuff everywhere and movement, especially in the basement was extremely limited, which explains why some of these things like the extent of the damage to the foundation just weren't fully apparent until the house was actually ours and we could really start tearing into it. And the foundation damage was exaggerated by problem number four, which is the shocking number of trees that are growing next to, or in some cases, literally right in our foundation. Now, I'm not sure whose bright idea it was to plant these trees here or who in the house's history decided to continue to let them grow even as they had their root balls literally centimeters from the house's foundation. Like I love trees as well. I get that they're beautiful and they give a lot of shade, but they're also incredibly detrimental to a house's foundation, as we started to see in last week's episode. Oh my god. Again, looking at Google Maps, we can see that somebody did try to cut down at least one of the trees, but they didn't actually kill it. They just kind of trimmed it back. So it slowly started to grow back and eventually caused this side of the foundation to cave in slightly. So 
This is a warning for everyone out there. Make sure you plant your trees a healthy distance away from your house. The rule of thumb generally seems to be to plant the tree as far away from the house as its full height at maturity, which honestly, it's a good policy for multiple reasons. Not only does it protect your foundation from the roots, but it will also protect your house if that tree falls in a storm. So double bang for your buck right there. That distance obviously is gonna change depending on the species of tree you're planting. I will leave you to do your own research, but trust me when I say you don't want to deal with roots in your foundation. So we have trees and water eating away at our foundation. And what does that lead to? Problem number five, a compromised sill plate. The sill plate or sill is literally the first piece of wood that touches the foundation and it's what all the rest of your house is built off of. It's usually quite large, it's a beefy piece of wood, and it's what anchors your house to the foundation. And as one website put it, the sill plate may be the single most important element of a house's structural framing. So not exactly something you want compromised and definitely not something you want to be looking like this. For a further explanation of this problem, let's jump back out to the backyard for a second and see kind of what's going on with our sill plate. And then there's about six or seven feet drop down to the low section of our yard. And then ideally we would be able to see at least three or four inches of foundation right here. But if we go and look close, we can see there's no foundation. In fact, there's actually more siding. There's at least two more strips of siding that have been buried from 120 years of dirt just coming with gravity and rain and everything into our yard and piling up here. Because if we look over here on this part of the house, you can see that it's actually really not bad. Here we can see we've got at least a couple inches of foundation visible. This is more what we want it to look like. And then as you go more towards the front of the house, you get more and more foundation, which is great. We like that. But over here, no foundation visible. And we're pretty sure that, you know, there's gonna be some rotting sill plate action happening, which is never great. So with all that wet, humid earth piling up literally right against our wooden sill plate, it's no surprise that there are a few places where it is failing or has completely flailed. And honestly, Phil and I are both shocked that the house hasn't suffered more, hasn't seen more drastic consequences than it has. And that's actually due in part, I think, to the meticulous construction methods that were used when this house was was framed out. I'll make sure to go into it more in a future episode when we actually start dealing with the sill plate problem, but the hand carved joinery that this house was built with, I'm pretty sure that literally kept it standing even when huge parts of the sill plate were rotten out from underneath it. But either way, uh, pretty high on the list of things to tackle is either repairing or completely replacing large sections of the sill. I don't think it's gonna be a surprise to anybody when you hear all of these problems to also learn that we have a ton of water in our basement. Literally, why wouldn't we? What is stopping the water from flooding into the basement? Because the hill sure isn't, the foundation and the sill plate sure aren't. So anytime that there's a rainstorm or a big snow melt, our basement is inundated with water. It comes in through the missing portion of the foundation and it also comes in through some of the cracks in the rocks because this foundation wall hasn't been repointed in well, a very long time, maybe never. So we definitely are gonna need to do something to fix all of the water in our basement. And what does having a bunch of water in a dark, humid, slightly stale environment lead to? The next problem, mold. It's probably not a surprise to anybody, especially if you've already seen the first couple episodes where we start to haul everything out of this basement, but we are dealing with a certain level of mold in here. So that's all that needs to be said about that for the moment. Without further delay, let's get out of this basement and go talk about the next problem on the list. And problem number eight takes me to another piece of gorgeous original woodwork, and that is these stunning windows. But before I get into it, on a window related side note, I had an amazing and unexpected response to the use of defenestration in last week's video. Y'all loved it. 
way more than I thought you would. Some of you said you had to go look it up. Some of you said you never thought you'd heard it outside of history class. And a couple of you suggested that I should make merch from it. So you never know, maybe one day we'll get some defenestration merch. I'm imagining, you know, the text atop of some of the wallpaper samples from the house, maybe on clothing or mugs or something like that. I don't know. Uh, if you have any ideas, if you're here for the defenestration merch, be sure to let me know down in the comments. Maybe one day it'll become reality. But to get back on track, talking about these windows here, they are huge. They are stunning. They are this fantastically unique shape on the outside of the house. And they are also in a terrible state of disrepair. Most of them are siliconed or painted shut. Well, that's not promising. So they don't even open and yet the paint is peeling, the wood is rotten and crumbling and the glazing is virtually non-existent in many places, which means we are about to lose a few panes of glass to gravity and note to self, I absolutely need to get out there and take them off before they fall because we cannot lose any more of that original wavy glass. So these windows will absolutely be saved, repaired and restored at least to the best of our abilities because we are not intending on replacing them with modern windows. That is in my opinion, one of the biggest swindles of the modern home improvement arena. And yes, that is the hill I will be dying on. As I've said it before, you can fight me in the comments but it is admittedly gonna take a lot of work to get them back to their original state because they are just in such a sad, sad condition. And if you're wondering why the windows are in such bad shape, I can tell you it's at least in part due to problem number nine, which is this siding. Oh, this siding. <laughs> there are so many things wrong with it. From the fact that we're just flat out missing an entire section of the house, it's literally this wall, just Tyvek to the heart where most of it is aluminum, but then the whole front section is actually vinyl. And actually I literally just when I was sitting down here to film it, realized that this little strip here, this one strip also vinyl, the rest aluminum. So it's a completely different size, texture, even color from the rest of the siding. It just looks super goofy. It's also not properly installed or at least has been severely compromised in sections. So like here, it's just, there's literally, it's being held on by screws. Not to mention the spray foam. Let's not even talk about the spray foam. Um, also there are in other sections where there are just giant holes in the siding. But the reason that it's causing problems with the windows is that there are multiple different layers of siding just smacked one right on top of each other without removing previous layers. You're actually gonna get a closer look at some of these layers in an upcoming episode here. Or if you follow me over on Instagram, you've already seen all about it in my stories. But basically it means that this current siding here now sticks out maybe six inches further away from the house than when it was originally built, which also then means that the windows, which should be standing proud from the facade, are completely recessed into the walls of the house, which is just directing the water in all the wrong places. Like I said, the water is basically the main culprit in the demise of our house. And then the last problem, number 10, is this back kitchen and entryway section here, because just looking at some clues in the house's construction, which I will get into in future videos, don't you worry, but there is a really good chance that these two rooms were added on somewhat after the rest of the house. Now, they're still really, really old, so it might've been only a few years after the original structure over here, but uh, regardless, it's not part of the original foundation and it's not part of the rest of the main basement, or at least if there is a basement under here, it's definitely a surprise to me. We think it's just a crawl space under here, but again, we're not sure because we haven't been able to look underneath. So at some point, we're gonna have to tear up this linoleum flooring, see what's underneath it, see if there's an access point. If there's not, we're gonna have to make one and get underneath and figure out just what's going on underneath here. But regardless, we're almost definitely gonna have to go in and do a lot of insulation just to try to have better control of the temperature in what's one of the main, most common, frequently used living spaces in the entire house. 
And as one last bonus, we get number 11, which is the roof. Now I got so many comments on the original house tour video from people very confidently stating that we would absolutely 100% need a new roof, which is funny because I didn't show a single exterior shot of the house. And the only evidence that they were basing this assumption off of was shots from this ceiling right here, which yes, those are potentially signs of water damage, but I already knew about this from the home inspection my inspector went up to the attic checked out the section of the roof right above that room and reported that the problem seemed to be taken care of and sure enough i found out within a couple days of arriving here that the damage was in fact caused during hurricane fiona it took off several roof shingles but they were all fixed before they sold the house so the section of the roof above that one room is actually one of the newest sections and it doesn't need any work done on it which I just thought it was kind of funny and goes to show that nobody is more confidently or assertively wrong than arrogant YouTube commenters. However, it is true by complete coincidence that the rest of this roof is actually fairly old and yes, does need to be replaced pretty quickly here. And it's not going to be a cheap job because the current roof is, let's just say it doesn't quite meet modern standards because even if we ignore the lack of insulation here, the current roof situation is a bunch of wooden planks and then shingles nailed straight onto that, which if you know anything about roofing, you're probably mildly freaking out right now because normally there'd be, well, normally there'd be sheets of plywood to start off with without any gaps in them. These planks are incredibly charming because they're hand hewn, but that also means that there are large gaps at several places. So normally there should be a good quality sheathing here without any gaps. And then you'd have some sort of underlayment layer, like a felt paper that sits between your decking and your shingles, just giving it that nice extra layer of protection in case you lose any shingles. And then your shingles are stapled onto that. Yes, I know I'm skipping a few things, ice and water barriers and ridge caps and flashing. I'm not here to give a lesson on roofing. I'm just trying to give an idea of the current state of my roof and why it's lacking. So eventually, and probably sooner rather than later, we're gonna have to replace this roof and the sheathing underneath it, and it ain't going to be cheap. And now the big question that we're debating is whether we put shingles back on or if we go with a metal roof, which does seem to be the smarter choice in terms of longevity, but it's also way more expensive up front. And the look is not my favorite. So I don't know, we'll see. I still need to do some more research on the topic and I'm hoping I have a year or two left in this roof in which to do that research, but I'm honestly not sure. So those are the biggest things that we have to tackle around the house. And now I thought let's talk very briefly about what kind of work it's going to entail to fix these problems. The easiest thing to tackle is going to be the tree situation. And you'll actually see us start on that journey next week. Although a spoiler alert, it won't be quite as simple as just cutting all the trees down. Then the gutter situation we're just gonna have to get up on the roof and install some gutters. Should be fairly quick and manageable, and once we've gotten some momentum from that, we can tackle some of the larger tasks like the grading and the foundation. For the grading of the house, we're gonna jump back one more time to that clip from outside because I did talk about it briefly while I was out there. 120 years of dirt just coming with gravity and rain and everything into our yard and piling up here. So what we're thinking we're gonna have to do, dig out a bunch of this here and just regrade everything so that instead of having the land come in down to the house, that the house sits on top and the land kind of goes down a little bit this way. It's probably gonna involve, you know, putting in a retaining wall right here somewhere and just getting a lot of this dirt away from the house and foundation. So yes, we will need to free up our foundation and pitch all of the earth to run away from the house, not only to keep the water out of our basement, but also so that we can expose the sill plate, which will almost certainly need to be replaced in certain parts. That's gonna be no mean feat in and of itself because how do you replace the single thing that your entire house is sitting on? 
well, carefully, but beyond that, it's probably gonna involve some bottle jacks and eye beams and a bit of ingenuity, not to mention custom woodworking. It should be an adventure and I hope you'll join us for it. Other things that involve custom woodworking are gonna be those windows. And they're probably the part that feels the trickiest in my mind because we don't really have the proper tools or knowledge to fully reconstruct them from scratch. So it's probably gonna involve some PC petrifier and some Abitron, maybe the liberal use of Dutchman, but I am on a quest to restore them. Also, we'll probably be building some new storm windows as well as restoring the few existing storms that we still have. And that should help protect the original windows as well as helping with insulating things around here in the winter. As for the siding, that is gonna be another massive project and probably a huge expense too. So it's a bit lower on the list. The one good thing about having, you know, 53 bajillion layers of siding is that even if the outermost one is a bit damaged, at least there are others underneath to help add some protection. Obviously, it's less than ideal, but before you rush to criticize me in the comments, please remember we are only two people doing this with limited time, energy, and budget, so prioritizing things is absolutely essential. As for the mold in the basement, generally speaking, once we take care of the reasons that the basement is flooding, like regrading the yard and installing some French drains, the flooding should stop. And while we might have to run dehumidifiers down there all summer long, the mold problem should pretty much go away on its own, especially once we start drying things out and circulating some fresh air and also probably installing some proper lighting down there would also go a long way towards helping the mold. Oh, and I realized I forgot to talk about insulating the kitchen and the entryway. That'll probably happen about the same time that we tackle the sill plate at the back of the house there, where it was all hidden underground by the siding, because replacing that will probably involve opening that part of the house up anyways. So I'm thinking we can probably just batch it all together and do it at the same time. So hopefully you found that at least somewhat interesting and insightful. I won't leave you with a teaser for next week since you already saw that last week, but instead here is some cute corgi footage to take its place. If you'd like to support the channel, remember I am both on Patreon and Coffee. And if you'd like to follow the progress more moment to moment, I'm on Instagram, Shannon Makes on all three platforms, and the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next week for more adventures. Bye.